And now it's time for RTB 101. This is the segment where we talk about practical questions to help equip you to share your faith with friends and family more effectively. And once again, I'm here with my colleague and minister of the gospel, Dr. Hugh Ross. Hello. And Hugh, there is a question that comes up a lot, a lot of confusion that our unsafe friend ha friends have is this business about when was the sun created? Because kind of a superficial reading of Genesis 1, it seems like it was created on day four, but that has some chronological problems. So help us think through when did the sun appear or what's happening here in the biblical text? Well, Crystal, let's go back to the beginning. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you know, there's no word in biblical Hebrew for universe, but they got this phrase, the heavens and the earth, always used to refer to the totality of physical reality. That's when God created matter, energy, space, and time. And then what we see on creation day one, let there be light. That's when the light that God created in the beginning first shows up on the surface of the earth. And notice Genesis 1, 2, darkness covers the face of the deep. It's dark because God had blanketed the seas of the earth with clouds that kept the light out. So creation day one miracle, God transforms the atmosphere from opaque to translucent. Okay, so let me make sure I got the sequence of events. Genesis 1-1, God created the heavens and the earth. That would include the sun. As sun, moon, and stars are part all of the included heavens. there. Right. That's part of the set of the heavens. Right. Genesis 1-2, then we switch the point of view to the surface of the earth, right. but it's cloudy. Right. So the sun is there, but we can't see it. It's not only cloudy, the clouds won't let any light through at all. It's okay. like the clouds on Venus. Okay, and then we get to creation day one, we can start to see the light from the sun, right. which has been there since verse one, right. but now that light is coming through the clouds. But it's like it's permanently overcast. Okay. You can see the sun's light, but you can't see the sun. Okay. Not until the fourth day does God transform the atmosphere to translucent. And I think this is clear because it says in verse 14, let there be the great lights so that they may serve as signs to mark seasons, days, and years. Obvious question, for whose benefit? Well, notice the animals aren't mentioned until day five. Okay. And they're the only life forms on planet Earth that need to see the position of the sun, moon, and stars in order to regulate their biological clocks. So in anticipation, God knows, okay, I'm going to make animals. Right. I need to have a sky where the sun, moon, and stars are visible to help the animals that are coming regulate their body clocks. Right. Okay. Right. Perfect. So then there's always this question of the word made in verse 16, because it says God made the great lights. That kind of sounds like they're appearing for the first time. So help me understand yeah, that. Yeah, verse 16 says God made the sun, moon, and stars. Verse 14, God uh, let there be the great lights. So it's basically saying these objects that creatures have seen in the sky for the first time, let me tell you what they are. They're objects that God made. Now, it doesn't tell you when he made them. The implication is he made them sometime in the past and it's simply not disclosed in that verse exactly when he made them in the past. But if you go back to Genesis 1, 1 to 1, 3, they were made before the atmosphere was uh, made translucent. Perfect, so they were made at some point in the past that's not defined, right. which could be all the way back in verse one. Right. Okay, I think I'm clear on that. So then that answers the common skeptic question of how did plants survive before the sun? Right. The sun was there, it was just cloudy. Yeah, the heat and the light of the sun were there so plants could survive, but the animals needed to know where those objects were. Oh, that's perfect. Okay, so this is really going to help me when I'm talking to my non-believing friends to help them make sense of what Genesis 1 says, that it's not scientific nonsense, but it actually fits with what we fits know. Fits perfectly with the science. That's great. Thanks, Hugh. And I want to encourage everyone to check out Hugh's blog, Today's New Reason to Believe. You can get that on our website at reasons.org.